it was it was something that uh, I didn't really I hadn't really met that many other people who were kind of obsessed with it, and so it was definitely something. We were working together on a show that was before Space, in fact, called Asylum, and uh, we definitely sort of bonded because we knew sort of everything about it. And, and Dawn of the Dead, the Romero one, had been unavailable on video in the UK for like years and years. So I had read about that film when I was. This is in the days before the internet when you had to wait to see a movie. And I read about that film when I was like five or six and like poured over every like picture in like Fangoria and Starburst, which was like a UK magazine. And I didn't see it until I was like 15 or 16. Like when it finally kind of like was released in a kind of completely cut form in uh, the UK. So, and it's one of those things where you know, like, if you're waiting to see a movie for a really long time and then it actually, like, stands up to the, you know, your anticipation of it. Um, so I was so excited watching the movie and then Simon was, like, the only other person that I knew that was, knew everything about it, you know. Yeah, had that sort of same, the kind of, uh, the rhythm of the, the relationship with it, like that. That he, uh, he had been anticipating it as well. Yeah, no, we both, um, we, we, we both felt exactly the same about it, that we, it's one of those movies where you read everything about it before you'd seen it, which I used to do a lot when I was a kid. Yeah, it was a very different experience. I remember, like, reading Starlog and seeing the Snowtrooper and Empire Strikes Back, you know, and you would, you see this picture and you'd kind of study it for months and months and months waiting for the movie to come out, and it's, now, you know, you, these days with the saturation, you feel like you've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, you feel like you've seen every movie, scene in the movie before six months before it comes out. Well, it's funny, like, when you think about people as, you know, get kind of, uh, all bothered about spoiler alerts and stuff, but I remember, like, reading the novelizations before seeing the movie. Yeah. Like, all the Alan Dean Foster books and stuff, I'd sort of read, like, Alien, Aliens, all the Star Wars books before I'd seen the movie. I was kind of so, you know, um, excited about seeing them, I had to know everything. And it didn't, didn't hurt my enjoyment of the actual film. Yeah. Well, Splinter of the Mind's Eye certainly didn't undermine anything. Yeah. <laughs> that way. But um, with Sean, uh, one of the, the things I like best about the movie is that it, it's not a spoof. I mean, there's a lot of horror spoofs, and this is not one of them. I mean, the peril is real. Uh, that, was that a fundamental early, is that, were you always going in that direction? Yeah, that was, that was something that we really sort of strived to kind of get right, and it was always a thing that was difficult to explain to people when we were trying to pitch the movie, because we didn't want to do a zombie spoof, and in fact, We'd even look to other, you know, we looked to other films to sort of really try and like, because even within horror comedy, like which is a, you know, two genres together, there are so many different flavors, so to speak. And so we'd look at other films and sort of say, oh, we don't want it to be, even ones that we liked, you know, and because we didn't wanted to do something that was a bit different or like was kind of specific to us. So even though we were fans of say. Evil Dead 2 or like Peter Jackson's Dead Alive, didn't really want it to be exactly like that, you know, to so try and find its own kind of groove. <coughs> and in a way, the film that we like looked to the most in terms of like the, our uh, like um, touchstone was not a zombie film, it was like uh, John Landis' American Wealth in London. Oh, sure. Because, uh, you know, and I think uh, John Landis' film is scarier than ours, but I, I always loved like that it was really scary, really gory, but also really sweet natured and you really cared about the characters, and you didn't really want anybody to die, like, um, which was an important thing. And that, that's actually one of the things about the George Romero Dawn of the Dead, is um, you know, there's so few characters in it, you don't really want any of them to die, even the, even the coffee one, you know, even Roger, like, sort of, you, you're sort of willing them all to pull through. And that was, that was a thing that we wanted to do with, with Sean, is like, is invest in most of them, some of them, some of them are, some of them are asking to get bitten. Um, but invest in most of them so you would feel when some of them that got kind of bitten, uh, you would really feel it if you liked them. I always felt that about American Wealth in London is I was, when I first saw it when, who hasn't seen it? I don't want to ruin it for anybody who hasn't seen it. You should. But there's, there's one, uh, well I won't ruin it too much because it's in the first like 10 minutes, but when Griffin Dunn gets killed, oh. it's just like, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> it came out in 1981 for fuck's sake. Rosebud is a sled. <laughs> what? <laughs> but he, he, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, an amazing thing in that film is that the person who's like, you know, yeah. a really charming actor is like dead in the first kind of like, with, by the end of the first reel. And so then, like, all bets are off, you know. So we like that idea. But, I mean, it was definitely something that we, we, we tried to work really hard to, um, 
And we still had these theories. What was funny is when we first started writing it, there were no other zombie films on the horizon that we could see. Right. And in a way, like what had inspired it is uh, we we're both fans of the Romero films. Um, we'd done this. Uh, we done this episode of Spaced, and that was inspired by the Resident Evil games. Because I think when the Resident Evil games came out, um, you could tell that the, you know, it, I think it inspired a lot of other things. Like, I think it sort of it was res sort of responsible for the resurgence of zombies. I think sure. the games that is, you know, and um, and I, what was funny is that when so when we started writing, like in two thousand one, we'd had the idea in between Space Series one and two. So like sort of at the end, literally at the end of the shoot of the first series of Spaced, um, which the zombie scene was the last thing that we did. And I remember being in a cab with Simon on the way to the rap party and saying, hey, we should do a whole zombie film. And that was kind of the start of it. But then like, I remember then vividly that we'd started writing and then I got a call from Simon saying, hey, uh, did you hear that Danny Boyle's doing a zombie film? And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I was so mad. I was so mad because I thought, wait, but what? Like, and um, yeah, 28 days later it was happening and we suddenly thought, oh no, like we're screwed. And, and then we found out about Zach's film as well. It was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and suddenly all these zombie films are crawling out of the... And the only, the only one we were really aware of was, I think, Resident Evil, the first one had come out. But it was, it was... So we'd sort of gone from like, um, thinking that we were the only zombie film, saying, hey, wouldn't it be great to do a zombie film because nobody had done one. For quite a long time, there hadn't been, you know, the 90s was quite a kind of like a, you know, um, uh, uh, quiet period. <laughs> Cemetery Man, Return of the Living Dead 3, not that, what other one? what other the 90s zombie films? Not that many, Dead Alive, but not that many really. And then we, we always had this theory that as much as we liked sort of John Landis' thriller video, we saw the thriller killed off the zombies for about 15 years. <laughs> Not because they're, the zombies are great, but because they're, because they're a kind of, and they're f comedic in a way, they're dancing, and so they were no longer, and I, we, we, me and Simon always pointed to, we thought the, 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 low, the low point of zombie cinema um, was not thriller, because thriller's great, it's in Return of the Living Dead 2, when a zombie, uh, turns up as Michael Jackson and starts body popping. <laughs> and that was like, the, the, that was, for, as far as we concerned, the zombies had reached the low ebb. Clearly. Yeah. So when you see Return of the Living Dead Part 2, and it happens in the last five minutes of the film, and you think, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the funny thing uh, Rick Baker has is notebooks. Have you, uh, do you know him? Have you ever talked to him? Yeah, I met him. Yeah. Okay. Did he, uh, he has a note on one page, it says, um, Thriller video, dot dot, and then it says, "Dancing zombies might be cool." And I'm like, dude, you gotta cut that page out. Maybe put that in the frame. That's a good. It was a good instinct he had. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that 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 is uh, you know. Um, but it, it's, it's that thing that it was. Um, I think for a long time, like Day of the Dead, the third Romero film, kind of remained like the classic zombie film, yeah. and even just the effects, like they were kind of unsurpassed and still look really good. Like the sort of the Tom Savini makeup in. Um, Day of the Dead, which uh, Greg and Gutierrez worked on as well. Sure. It still looks really great, and so I think you know, even when we were prepping Shaun of the Dead in like 2003, we would look back to like a 1985 film for like you know the the pinnacle of zombie makeup effects. Sure. And then you, uh, you ended up, uh, and along with Simon, having a fantastic experience with George, which must must have been uh, a really special thing for you. He was like the first person that we reached out to when we finished the film because we wanted to get like his blessing and we thought he might, we hoped he might dig it and we, I know, we, 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 Universal tracked him down, we were in London and he was on holiday in Florida and he was up for watching the movie and so he watched it on his own in a theatre in Florida and he, no, he watched it on his, the only other person in the, in the screening room was a Universal security guard in case George might pirate the movie. <laughs> like, we didn't owe him money, like, for stealing the title. So I love the idea that, like, sort of they thought, well, what if George Romero steals the reels of the film? <laughs> um, so, so George watched it, and then we got a call from him later that night, and he couldn't have been sweeter about it. And, and, and what we tried to do, and I, I guess similar to, to Rob's show, we tried to set it within 
George's universe. Like the the, the, the idea, because that was one of the things I always loved about the um, the original um, Romero trilogy. Is as far as I could think, they were the only like horror franchise or any any franchise that took uh, different stories within the same crisis. Like there are no returning characters. Right. It's like this is happening in this farmhouse. This is happening in this mall, and this is happening in Florida at the same time. So our idea was Sean was that this is happening in London, this is happening at the same time. So we sort of tried to do something where, and that was part of the comedy horror thing, is we tried not to make the zombies too funny. It's, it's like the, it's the reactions of the characters is nearly all of the jokes. <coughs> and their reactions to the fact that, you know, the world is ending, and that they're going to die, and sort of having, you know... Uh, and, and, and also, it was, and, and then the other inspirations for it, apart from... Was, was basically that feeling of being in a city. I mean, LA's not quite the same thing, because you don't walk around a lot in LA. But in London, you know, similar to New York, you do a lot of walking. And when people kind of commute and they do a lot of walking, they also do a lot of, like, completely blanking things out. So, having been in London, just on the, you know, on the subway and on the bus and, and just walking down the street, people become very numb to what's going on around them. So even if there's, like, sort of a fire alarm going off, or police sirens going off, or a fire engine going by. Barely anybody stops and looks. Like, it's just kind of, you just, you're in this little bubble. And so that was the idea with Sean, is that he's like somebody who just doesn't see what's going on around him. And uh, he's the sort of, and you know, like, so, and, the, and we like the idea of like doing a movie where the leads for nearly all of the film are hung over. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was that key thing as well. It's just sort of slightly slow reactions because they were really drunk the night before. <laughs> and I remember, do you remember like the, the I don't know if it was like the, in England they had the foot and mouth crisis, which is when they like, um, uh, it was similar to, I guess, to sort of swine flu. Oh. And uh, it was a big deal, but I can't remember what I was doing, but I'd been busy or, or just kind of caught up in my own problems. And then the first thing that I saw about it was TV footage of like a huge pile of cattle being burnt. And I was just watching the news going, wait, what is this? <laughs> like, and so that's kind of the expression for Sean in terms of like the last person, he would be the last person to switch on CNN and see what the fuck was going on. Because there's gonna be that guy, you know. <laughs> and that's the same in like any kind of place, you know, on a very serious note, this is not funny at all, but I remember um, when we were writing the script, we finished, the first draft of the script on September the 10th, 2011. And, uh, oh, so, no, sorry, 2001, of course. Um, and the thing that, like, was really, like, sort of a, a, a extremely alarming, well, one thing that I took away from it that kind of factored into the film was that, and I'm sure it's the same in any city, was that when people found out about the Twin Towers, you would see the looks on people's faces that they knew and then you would see the other people that were still shopping or doing something else. And you would think, do they know? Do they care? Like, so what's going on? It was a very, very surreal, like, 24 hours after that event where, like, most people knew, but not everybody knew, and some people were just carrying on with their daily business. I found that really disturbing, and that's something that kind of... We'd already written it into the film, but it's sort of, it's like it came true, seeing, like, a, a, a global crisis and seeing the very surreal reactions to it. And besides sort of underlining that, was there anything that, given that timing, <coughs> that you went back and changed in the script just because you observed something that you could add or maybe something didn't seem to have the same, uh, the sort of same connection? There is something that uh, is... The, the, the scene. Has anybody not seen it before? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, well, maybe I'll talk about this after. I don't want to completely ruin it for you. There's like a. There's, well, somebody dies in the movie. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> I don't want to ruin it for the two people that haven't seen it. But some, somebody important dies in the movie. And I'd say when we shot that scene, there were a couple of. Ex jokes that happened immediately after that death in the script. And when we came to shoot it, uh, we loved the actor, could be actor, actress, we loved the actor so, so much that it was distressing to shoot it, the scene. And Simon got really emotional doing it. And like when you see that in the movie, that's kind of real. Like Everybody was like tired and exhausted. And it was also towards the end of the shoot. So this actor, it was also their last day on set. 
so when they shot that scene, they were also then gone and in their car and gone completely. Like once they've been out of makeup, you just didn't like see them again. And when we shot the, the bits that come immediately afterwards, there were some more jokes, and we shot some of them, and it just didn't feel right. And they were kind of in the script. They seemed like kind of as good or as bad as any other joke in the film. But weirdly, you kind of found like, oh, wow, you kind of need some grieving time after a lead character goes. It's too soon to make jokes, literally. And so that's things that change. We cut them out because it just didn't feel like. So, it, but it was very, it was, it was very interesting how, even though it was a comedy, shooting the kind of the, the dark bits kind of was quite emotionally exhausting. You know, uh, I, I was reading something uh, about Scott Pilgrim, which is a movie I, I love. Uh, um, and someone was talking about your body of work and, and, and the idea that you seem to enjoy doing mashups of genres, putting genres together. Um, I think, I think why that is is I only do one film every three years, so I try and do four at once. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the funny thing is, is that they they all feel uh, to me so of a whole that I don't really think of them that way. They don't feel like math to me, like this plus this. They just seem like Scott Pilgrim. Um, do you consciously look to put things together, or is that just sort of being a child of pop culture? You know, it, this is just how you see things. That you you blur them together. I, I guess like and Scott Pilgrim was slightly different because it's an adaptation, but it had yeah. the same the same thing. Is it's just filtering it through your own eyes. Like so, Shaun of the Dead is like literally me and Simon having watched a lot of those films and thinking, what if this happened on our doorstep in our neighbourhood, which is where we <coughs> shot the movie. It was all in North London. So it's a comedy, but it was also kind of very personal. And um, then you know, in Hot Fuzz, like it's like I grew up in that area. Uh, of the country, and I was a big, I love cop movies, but I could never imagine one happening in my hometown because it was boring. <laughs> so again, it's like, yes, it's kind of like a riff on cop films, but it was like, so what if this happened, you know, where I grew up? Scott Pilgrim is, is Brian Lee O'Malley's creation, but I, I, I really connected with it because I felt like there had been that age, and some people continue in that age, where if you're experiencing a lot of pop culture or media yourself, you might live your life through it. Like if you were a big gamer, you might start to kind of like be in the game and lose grip with reality, or only be able to relate to real life through the games you're playing or the, you know, the, the music you like. And so, so I, I think sort of that they, they do have lots of genres in them, but it's almost in different ways like my reaction to that, rather than sitting there and saying, Let's put, you know, chocolate and junior mints together. Chocolate ice cream. It sounds good. <laughs> Run with it. Uh, and one of the things, too, that um, I always uh, wonder about is uh, collaboration. You know, when you find someone that you collaborate with in a very kind of organic way, obviously you and Simon uh, work together quite a lot, what you sort of learned about collaboration and, and, and what, uh, where the writing stops and begins for each of you? Um, with Simon, you know, we worked, we sit opposite each other and write the script and, you know, and we usually have one, la one laptop and one person types and the other one paces around and we take it in turns and we just get through it. Um, you know, uh, out of the, because we've written a third one as well, but the, the, the Hot Fuzz was the hardest one to write because we sort of came away with a headache and a newfound appreciation for Agatha Christie and how those plots are not easy to actually write. Um, so that was the hardest one to write because we're sort of trying to write kind of like a, a thriller plot and also have, you know, a, a secondary kind of plot as well. But um, Sean, we, um, yeah, we, we wrote it, we, we did a big, it was the first screenplay either, either of us had written really. I'd written some things when I was like very young. But <coughs> never properly formatted, uh, but uh, um, this one, we, we, we read some script writing books and we also got kind of very um, sort of uh, swatty and um, we, watched, we watched our favourite movies and we tried to apply the Sid Field 3X structure to them. We actually sat down with like a chart and we would watch like Tremors or Gremlins <laughs> or American Wealth in London and try and break down like the act structure. Uh, and the birds. I think we did it with a bunch of things where we would watch the things and we would sort of like look at the look at the the time and try and break it down. 
And so we sort of did that a bunch before we started writing Shaun of the Dead. And we sort of tried to look, there's a lot of like films that we liked, the, the structure of them, where they had a lot of cyclical jokes and, 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 and interesting kind of payoffs and stuff, everything from like, a lot of the Robert, Robert Zemeckis, Bob Gale scripts are really good like that, like Back to the Future. And, and I think Gremlins is a really good script as well. Um, and what other ones like that? Um, there's, there's a bunch of things that we watched. Um, uh, uh, the, the other one that's a big influence on this film, again, not a comedy, is Philip Kaufman's remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the Donald Sutherland one, which he hadn't, if you haven't seen it, is really great. And uh, the, the, mood, the mood of, like, Sean owes something to that movie as well. And then 